He's been working on Zelda for nearly a quarter of a century, and yet many people don't even know who he is. Unlike series producer Eiji Numa, who has come to be associated with the Zelda franchise over a very long time period, director Hidamaru Fujibayashi is relatively little known, despite being intimately involved in so many of the series' most iconic moments. A literature graduate, a Gundam superfan, a Kyoto homeboy and Zelda's youngest and most prolific director, there is so much to know about this video gaming icon that you may never have known before. So let's take some time to find out the true story of the man who has changed Zelda forever. Let's truly meet Hidamaru Fujibayashi. Aged 50 at the time of Tears of the Kingdom's release, Hidamaru Fujibashi grew up in Nintendo's home city of Kyoto and played games from a young age, his first being 1983's Donkey Kong Jr. on the Famicom. And by the end of high school, he was obsessed by A Link to the Past. But as a young teenager, he had his first and most formative experience, the original Legend of Zelda. As he recalled, I was in my first year of middle school when I heard that the Famicom Disk System would be released in January, so I excitedly saved up my money for it. I remember running to buy it, fist tight around my New Year's money. It turned out the release date was delayed and teary-eyed I returned home and had to wait another whole month. The Famicom Disk System, which Fujibayashi was to describe as fresh and revolutionary with particularly great background music, was indeed pushed back by a month. It was therefore February 1986 before the 13-year-old Hidemaru got his hands on the Famicom Computer Disk System along with the very first Zelda. Little could he realise what a life changer that franchise would prove to be for him. Even today, he sees that game as a benchmark for the series, mentioning to Games Radar, The look and feel of the game has changed with the times, but I don't think the core gameplay of the series has changed at all compared to that of 30 years ago. I feel that's because even though the puzzle-solving elements of the series change with the times in how the players interact with it, the fun of it, the fun I experienced for the first time myself as a child, is still there in the more recent Zelda titles completely unchanged. With all the construction and intricate puzzles in the game, you might imagine he had a background in engineering or some kind of technical subject, but in fact he studied Japanese and contemporary literature at a private Buddhist university, which values holistic education where students can grow in a quest to realise their own ideals. As he was graduating, he knew that he wanted to seek employment where he might create something, but what form that creativity would take was not immediately clear. He flirted with the idea of designing theme park rides and did some research into making haunted houses, but it was looking at a magazine job ads that took him down a different path. Of his journey, he later reflected, I studied literature at Buddhist college. My student days were totally unrelated to what I'm doing now. When I started looking for a job, all of my friends went on to become monks, so they didn't actually do any job hunting. I had never planned to be a monk, so I started looking through the magazine job ads. I'd always liked games, and as I looked at the magazines, a little light went off in my head, like, oh yeah, you know, games are made by companies that I could get hired at. If possible, I'd like to work at a company in Kansai, I thought, so I applied to Capcom. Yes, since Nintendo weren't hiring at the time, after a short stint at another video game creator, he landed on his feet instead at Capcom, who, like Nintendo, were based in the Kansai region of Japan, which contains the cities Kyoto and Osaka. At this time, Zelda was the last thing on Hidemaru Fujibashi's mind. Instead, he had another property that was obsessing him, Gundam. Lining up all his Gundam models on his desk, he began a concerted effort to pressure his bosses into helping him make a Gundam game. This of course went nowhere, but he did work on a variety of titles and took the director's chair for the first time in the 1998 puzzle title, Disney's Magical Tetris. Joining Capcom was to be particularly fortuitous, however, as Capcom designer Yoshiki Okamoto had been setting up a studio called Flagship with the aim to produce titles collaborating with the two publishing giants of the late 90s video game scene, Nintendo and Sega. It began in early 1999, only weeks after the release of Ocarina of Time had redefined everything the world thought it knew about three-dimensional adventure games, which in those early days for 3D probably wasn't much at all. Back then, the initial idea was for Capcom to remake the original Legend of Zelda game for the Game Boy Color, but the plan soon evolved into a pitch to create an original game. In fact, an original trilogy of games. As Okamoto's assistant, Fujibayashi put together the proposals from the ideas and Okamoto gave him the shot as director when the games progressed to full development. A duology, rather than a trilogy by the end, by the names of Nut of the Mysterious Tree, Chapter of Earth, and Fruit of the Mysterious Tree, the chapter of time and space. 
Although later, as well, there, Nintendo sought to make their title link up across the different regions. In those days, Zelda games often had quite different titles when they released in the West, and so these games are better known in English as Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages. It was in his capacity as the director of the Oracle's titles that Fujibayashi san was told that a forthcoming meeting would include his first chance to meet two senior figures from different games companies. One of the people's identity is unclear, but since Capcom's partnership included Sega, it's possible this was a meeting of the company flagship, which suggests that the other studio head would be from Sega. The other individual, however, was someone who needs no introduction. The other person was Nintendo Shigeru Miyamoto. Faced with the prospect of meeting two industry titans, Fujibashi san recalls having palpitations, and when it came to the actual pitch that followed the first meeting, he recalls clearly Miyamoto's response. Fujibashi san recounts, Miyamoto-san remained silent throughout the whole presentation too, so I was quite nervous. But when we finished reading our proposal out to him, he said, I had thought there'd be many loose ends and a plan to strike, but it looks like you've got a good handle on things. And he approved it, saying, I think it's fine. If this sounds like rather muted praise, it was to become typical of Fujibashi's relationship with his brilliant, but perhaps sometimes difficult to impress, mentor. Fujibashi later joked that the first time Miyamoto ever praised him was when implementing a reference control system with Wii Motion Plus. Of course, that's just Miyamoto's inscrutable manner. When talking about the specifics of Miyamoto's influence, however, it's striking that Fujibashi talks not about the abstruse gameplay principles, but about how Miyamoto made him think about the feel of each game. He explains, Back in the day, I'd play Nintendo games and think all their games had a common feel to them. When I met Mr. Miyamoto, I clearly understood that there's a logic behind the games that he thinks up. Understanding that was a huge learning experience for our team. Another thing was that Mr. Yamada and company would ask us, what's this character name? About characters we just randomly put in the game. Giving those characters a name really brings them to life and the staff's attachment to them involves too. You should name your characters. Such a simple sounding idea really opened my eyes to something important. This is just one example, but I feel like I was taught the secret to Nintendo's warm game feel. What makes me the happiest was that both Mr. Yamada and Mr. Miyamoto treated me as though I was a member of Nintendo. We talked not as Nintendo or Capcom staff, but as staff working together on the creation of a game. I believe that, in the end, this kind of welcoming feeling influenced Zelda. The idea of a warm game feel perfectly encapsulates to me what makes Nintendo games stand out, and I definitely feel that warmth permeates Fujibayashi's later Zelda titles as well. And there was a warm game feel behind the scenes too, as Fujibayashi-san seems to have become part of the Nintendo family long before it became official. In 2004, Anuma joked, he's been working with us on Zelda for so long now, I sometimes forget he's not a Nintendo employee. Fujibashi added, when Miyamoto speaks now, he doesn't say, with Capcom, he says, with Fujibashi-kun. My team loves to hear that. It doesn't make us feel like, here's Nintendo and here's Capcom. It feels like we're all under the same tent, working together as one team on Zelda. Another key influence was Tezuka, whose innumerable credits over his years at Nintendo include as the creator of Devil World and the director of Super Mario Bros. 3 and A Link to the Past. Although nowadays Fujibashi-san finds that these names don't ring a bell so much as when he mentions that Tezuka-san was also the creator of Animal Crossing. You see, as much as we now think of Eiji Onuma as the master of the Zelda universe, it's striking that for much of Hidemaru Fujibashi's early career, his formative influences and mentors were from the oldest days of Zelda, such as Miyamoto and Tezuka, giving him a hinterland that might explain his confidence to push back on Onuma at points, as we'll explore later on. He later said, more than anything, what's influenced my personal understanding of what a Zelda game should be has been the teachings I've received from Shigeru Miyamoto in the years since the Oracle games, Fujibashi reflected in 2017. I really feel that it's not because of knowledge or experience that I'm here working as a developer for Zelda, but because of the people. The Oracle games are somewhat obscure now, despite coming to Nintendo Switch Online, trapped on the Game Boy Color hardware with no remake likely in sight, but the games were startlingly ambitious. Fujibashi notes that the final game was 10 times the size of his initial plan. We also get a sense of Fujibashi-san's tenacity as he describes how he essentially poached the best and brightest from across Capcom. He said of the two games, we developed them one at a time with the same team. At first it was just me exchanging ideas with the scenario team. Then as the scenario progressed, I discreetly approached the Capcom artist and programmers I was interested in. This sort of HR thing is normally handed by my direct supervisor, Funamizu. 
He's referring to Capcom general producer at the time, Noritaka Funomizu, who also would have been responsible for Resident Evil 3, Street Fighter 3, Power Stone, Marvel vs. Capcom, and probably any number of titles that could be more pressing to Capcom than a Zelda spin-off on a Game Boy Color. Fujibashi-san was undeterred, adding, I thought I'd best sound the staff off first. Funomizu scolded me, saying, that's my job, but I still got the staff members I wanted to join the team. Having built that team though, they seemed incredibly close and Fujibashi is quick to credit the importance of the whole team. Yeah, you know, he's quoted as saying, If I was left alone to make a Zelda game, it would probably come out very unusual. We get better results if I just create the outline, the empty vessel, and then have everyone pour their different opinions and ideas into it. My role is then to pick out the good ideas and trim away the things that went too far. As development progressed, Fujibashi-san ended up split between three offices. Capcom's offices in Osaka, the offices of developer Flagship in Tokyo, and Nintendo's offices in Fujibashi's home city of Kyoto. Nevertheless, as Fujibashi-san tells it, Oracle's development was not stressed and did not fit into the stereotype of the oppressive Japanese game development workspace. He mentions, There's a dark tower in Oracle of Ages with people made to work there. Their dialogue is along the lines of, There's no end to this work, or I can't go home. There were also team members that couldn't go home much during development, so we put those characters in as a parody. But our team feels really cosy, so the general atmosphere was great. People who just come by with a message would end up in a meeting and chat with us for two hours before leaving again. I suppose we must allow for the possibility that, as the leader of the project, he was unaware of the deep stress levels found by those on his team, or else did not want to confess to running a stressed and tortured game development in a public forum, but the description of crunch stopping people going home was typical of the 90s games industry, and while it would be frowned upon now, it's hard to say how the team really felt about it. Later events seem to bear out that Fujibashi-san is a good, perhaps even excellent manager and director. You don't get to the level of seniority he has running multiple huge games without having management skills as well as creative genius, and we'll soon see how his management style evolved as he moved on to more ambitious projects. Sometimes, though, he needed to make critical decisions, and he proved that he has a capacity to turn a tactical blind eye to occasional local frustrations. For example, when the team implemented the item of the beetle in Skyward Sword, it created problems with players being able to see things they shouldn't see yet. The landform staff apparently wouldn't stop complaining about it, and Fujibashi is quoted, perhaps tongue-in-cheek, as saying, They were livid, but we squeezed it in and turned it into a very user-friendly item. As much as the Zelda games are challenging and involve puzzle solving, his experience of making the games also became puzzle-like. Nintendo wouldn't start with the ideas and characters as Capcom and Western studios often did, but first developed a robust core gameplay, and only after work out what the story is that motivates the action. Working backwards in this way, even up to Tears of the Kingdom, clearly appeals to the director, with Fujibashi san quoted as saying, The way we make the Legend of Zelda games is like solving a puzzle, so it's really enjoyable. The Oracle's games released in February 2001. Hidamaru Fujibashi was 28 years old. Yes, you heard that right. Fujibashi's son was directing one of the most iconic video game series in the history of the medium in his 20s, and he was not done yet. In fact, he had barely started. Next, he directed Four Swords, an additional game packaged in with the Game Boy Advance version of A Link to the Past. And soon after, he moved to developing another full 2D game for Game Boy Advance, a game based on the theme of large and small that was to become Minish Cap. This intriguing game heralded two innovations in the franchise that perhaps may have greater significance later on. The first is the Picori, the tiny little people. We know that a village of similar Lilliputian-sized characters were once planned for inclusion in Breath of the Wild, so clearly the idea still resonates with Fujibashi and his team. However, the most astonishing and enduring innovation from Minish Cap, the one Fujibashi loves, may not be the one you think. Instead, he was obsessed by the Gust Bellows. Of this dungeon item that allows you to blow away cobwebs and turn cogs from a distance using the power of wind, Fujibashi enthused later in an interview with Satoru Iwata that it can do anything. I love it. It can even do this. After all, it's a magic jar. Reflecting on the success of this mechanic, we start to see the seeds of Fujibashi's philosophy. He explains, A game is fun when it has profoundly mysterious things, and also we figure it's best to prepare items for doing all kinds of things from the very start. Hmm. Interacting with mysterious things, using items available from the start, sounds like the kind of thing that came to be the very core structure of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. And sure enough, Fujibashi-san's explanation of the development of the Minish Cap give an insight into his process that feels 
very reminiscent of his work even recently on Tears of the Kingdom. Just as Tears of the Kingdom had the central theme of hands that pervaded everything from the ultra hand, the hand symbols on the shrines and more, Minish Cap also had that strong central theme, big and small. Because this idea was hard to comprehend from words alone, he approached some of his collaborating artists from Four Swords and prepared detailed storyboards to show his ideas. Years later, following Nintendo's philosophy of make before you talk, he would hack together a vehicle in Breath of the Wild to prove that this gameplay option had potential, potential which would develop and evolve into Tears of the Kingdom. With regard to Minish Cap, Fujibashi also talks about the unique gimmicks that define Zelda games. He said, we have to find that something extra. Oracle had the gimmick where Link can change the map with the Rod of Seasons. When we started thinking about what the gimmick could be for Minish Cap first, we knew it couldn't be that far removed or that out there from the world of Zelda. I started thinking, what feature of these games could we possibly expand on? What dimensions could we explore? Front and reverse, past and future, light and darkness. We've done all these before, but could some other pairing remain? I racked my brain until I realized, aha, if we make Link small, that would be like entering a whole world within its own. What's interesting here is that the gimmicks he's describing are very much top-down, whole-world, systemic gimmicks, structures that alter the gameplay by altering the world around. This was completely fitting for the Zelda games of the era, and indeed most Zelda games throughout history. The 3D Zelda of the Nauters include a world threatened by an incoming moon, a world changed by the rise of the Great Sea, and a world intersected with the Twilight Realm. This bears further examination of the time, but it strikes me that the era of the wild games have a slightly different sensibility, more concentrated perhaps on what people can do and how they use the skills to interact than internally imposed constructs like a Twilight Realm or a Journey to the Past. At any rate, Fujibashi's influences are revealed still further by the dungeon items he developed, not just the Gus Bellows, which ended up having their own equivalents in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, but also the Magnetic Gloves, which perhaps foreshadowed Magnesis and then Ultra Hand. Admitting that it was hard to come up with new dungeon items, Fujibashi-san reflects that, in my case, I like to imagine things that appear in fairy tales or items used in scientific experiments. Well, if that doesn't sum up the items in Tears of the Kingdom, I don't know what does. He also reflects on the importance of balance in terms of the challenge games present. Of his time on the Minish Cap, he recalls, when the staff would bring me an idea where the difficulty of the action would be a time sink for the player, I tended to reject those ideas. When that happens, it tells me that something is lacking about the original design. Trying to cover that deficiency up with difficult sections, for example, by spewing a bunch of fast bullets on screen or placing a floor that moves really fast, I think that's a mistaken approach. If we were confident about the underlying design, we wouldn't be trying these quick fix patch ups. That's the theme of our development. When players solve a puzzle, we don't want them going, how the hell was I supposed to figure that out? Instead, we want them to feel a little embarrassed that they couldn't figure it out before. If players feel like the puzzles are cheap, that's a failure on our part. That's a vulgar, unrefined idea. We want them to think, ah, you got me. And then the next time they encounter a similar puzzle, they feel like they know what to do. Problems that build on and apply your knowledge is what we aim for. Working only on 2D games so far doesn't appear to have been a stumbling block at all for the director. It's true that his ambition showed a little with regard to the hardware when Four Swords Adventure came out on the GameCube. He said of the developers of that game, I was jealous of them because they were working on more powerful hardware and could do many of the things I'd wanted to do. Having said that, at the time he was more concerned with the 2D format, following his childhood wish that the Super Famicom would be replaced by an Ultra Famicom, the ultimate 2D game system, rather than something specifically for 3D. As he launched Minish Cap into the world, he commented, I've still got that ambition of wanting to release an even better 2D game into the world. I believe there's so much that can still be done with 2D. Of course, nearly two decades later, that dream is still unrealized, and indeed 2D Zelda is in a twilight realm of its own. If and when he takes on the reins of the franchise of Meiji Aonuma in the future, will his passion for 2D find a new expression? That's a discussion topic for another time, perhaps, so hit subscribe and like for more videos on this topic. By now, we're in the mid-2000s and Fujibashi-san had six years of experience working with Nintendo and a now well-honed game philosophy influenced by geniuses like Miyamoto and Tezuka. It was inevitable that Hidemaru Fujibashi would finally return home to Kyoto and join Nintendo full-time. Officially joining the company in 2005, his initial role was as a planner for the Entertainment Analysis and Development Division. He joined the Zelda team, who were in the middle of production of Phantom Hourglass. 
He came in no longer as the eager mentee, but with a scepticism and wisdom born of long experience developing Zelda games. Fujibashi said, when I joined the development team, he said, slightly extending both his hands, I was told that the game was supposed to have a certain scale, but I thought to myself that it wouldn't be possible. The Phantom Hourglass director Daiki Iwamoto concurred. When he joined the team, he made sure to confirm that. He asked me what the scope of the game was. Fujibashi said, they told me it was uh, two to three in a scale of zero to 10, but I have my doubts since the very beginning. This is an interesting interaction because it gets to the heart of Fujibashi-san's personality. Eiji Aonuma explained, Mr. Iwamoto, the director, is the kind of person that starts working diligently on small things and makes them grow fast. On the other hand, Mr. Fujibashi, the sub-director, understands pretty well the fate a Zelda game can have if you just keep expanding it, and he works with the big picture in mind. So I think they make a well-balanced team. Despite having a more junior role on Phantom Hourglass, a particular note is that he added one distinctive feature of the game, the ability to write down details on the DS screen in the same way he would scribble details in the guidebooks or magazines of his favourite RPGs. Phantom Hourglass released in 2007, and with Eiji Aonuma taking on more senior responsibilities at Nintendo, a new director was needed for the sequel to the Wii's Twilight Princess. With hindsight, Hidamaru Fujibashi must have felt like the inevitable and essential choice. Developing a console Zelda would prove to be a very different experience from a handheld game as the scale of the operation required a different skill set. It was more work, he noted, and making corrections was more difficult. Unlike when you have a tiny dev team on a handheld 2D title with a big AAA endeavour, once instructions go out to people, it's harder to make changes later on if what comes back is not what you expect. Still, you would think that with this wealth of experience, the development of Skyward Sword would be plain sailing, but that doesn't seem to be the case. In an Awata R segment reflecting on the evolution of Skyward Sword, Eiji Aonuma admits that there were twists, turns and detours in the game development process, perhaps explaining the, at the time, unprecedented five-year wait for the new release. Iwata, a genius developer in his own right, has an interesting take. My impression is that you were able to pack a lot of elements the team had worked on in the game, that it has turned out to have an incredibly high concentration of ideas, even compared to other Legend of Zelda games. There certainly seem to be parallels here with Tears of the Kingdom, which Anuma suggested was also a difficult and tricky road, if only because of the difficulty of balancing the freedom of the new mechanics with the capacity to completely break the game if you actually use them to their full potential. And it seems that a good chunk of the delay was due to, as Fujibashi puts it, having the time not just to make new things, but also plenty of time to make adjustments. The recent confirmation that Tears of the Kingdom was all but done at the time of the 2022 delay makes even greater sense when you consider Fujibashi's apparent commitment to tinker and perfect everything until it's just right. It certainly seems that Fujibashi and Nintendo are completely simpatico in ensuring the user experience is robustly playtested and as polished as it can possibly be. Another intriguing and slightly glossed over feature of the early development of Skyward Sword is that the Zelda team's reaction to Wii Motion Plus, which would come to be one of the central pillars of complaints against the title, were sometimes pretty muted. At one point, Eiji Aonuma proposed not to use Wii Motion Plus at all, before other producers told him not to run away from it. And Fujibashi-san has little positive to say about it in the early development interviews I've seen. He describes it as quirky, and also describes the difficulty of incorporating it while maintaining the game's cohesion as tricky. You may be fighting with your sword, and the next instant use the claw shots, or shoot an arrow, or throw a bomb, so it was really difficult to make the game so you could use the Wii Motion Plus to do these things smoothly, all on the same field, he explained. His solution, perhaps unsurprisingly given the very technical-minded man we've come to know, was the study of skeletal structure of elbows to make the look of the sword swing match the feel of delivering the swing. Although perhaps he's never quite as effusive as some of his colleagues are, he does ultimately praise the motion control system, agreeing with the point that people who are used to swinging the sword can't go back. Although he notes that the control systems are new, so some people will feel that something is a little off for the first 10 or 15 minutes, but they'll gradually get used to it. Skyward Sword also gives an insight into how themes coalesce in his games and how the titles are formed. Miyamoto suggested in his usual cryptic manner that as well as swinging the sword, the sword should also stop. Stop? Then, Miyamoto added the idea that the beam should build by holding the sword up. The visual icon and gameplay mechanic led to the idea of the title Skyward Sword. Aonuma explained, From what I heard from the NOA, Nintendo of America localization team, the word ward also meant to protect and guard something, so Skyward can mean protector of the sky, and one who is protected by the sky. 
By this point, unlike with the Oracle's titles, they were clearly running their titles past English language translators. I suppose for a massive tentpole title, it's perhaps not so surprising, but Nintendo is a very Japanese and often very insular company, and so this had not historically been the case with even bigger titles. Hence, the Western game A Link to the Past is Triforce of the Gods in Japan. The practice appears to have begun in the 2000s. The English translators of the 2007 DS Zelda liked the name Hourglass and asked for its inclusion, so it was christened Phantom Hourglass. This suggests to me that the ambiguity of the English language title Tears of the Kingdom, which could also be read as Tears of the Kingdom, reflecting the tearing up of Hyrule by Ganondorf and the Gloom, was probably partly deliberate, and if anything, the duality was probably more obvious to the Japanese team, because if you look at a dictionary definition of Tears and Tears, the two meanings will be adjacent, while the pronunciation differences mean that the comparison might not instantly occur to native speakers. Another of Fujibashi's interests became apparent in the ability to dash up after a sword fight so that being knocked down does not, as Fujibashi put it, interrupt the flow of the game. It strikes me that the same wish to keep the flow for players and to ensure upwards movement is the same instinct that led ultimately to the creation of the Ascend ability in Tears of the Kingdom, a traversal mechanic that helps players climb upwards at speed and avoid the frustration of being down for so long. Skyward Sword had many innovations that would prove formative, from the sailcloth to the stamina wheel, but if Skyward Sword is remembered for one thing, it's skydiving. And this is an obsession of Fujibashi that he would continue to push until it reached its greatest success in the form of Tears of the Kingdom. But where did this crazy idea come from? His inspiration was a television program he saw in which a young woman passed out in the middle of skydiving and another more experienced skydiver noticed and swooped over to her, held onto her, opened his own parachute and landed with her. Of course, while Skyward Sword received positive initial reviews, its reputation soon curdled as the difficult controls and its launch window in the twilight of the Wii era before the launch of the Wii U made it a difficult title to place. Evidently, the team at Nintendo did not break faith even slightly with their director, and with our Numeran team, Fujibashi continued on and became the director of the game that would become Breath of the Wild. The specifics of the evolution of Breath of the Wild are well documented from the 8-bit model game to the development of the idea of freedom and the commitment to reconsider the core tenets of a Zelda game. But focusing specifically on Hidden Mario Fujibayashi, it's interesting to see his feelings about the stress of producing the game for the launch of the Switch, or should I say, the lack of such stress. Of course, he says, we didn't have a huge amount of leeway in terms of time, but as director I wasn't particularly phased by this. I have a very strong impression that work proceeded without panic under the specific instruction of our producer, Mr. Anuma. Personally, when I started thinking about what kind of features the Nintendo Switch hardware had, I ended up thinking about whether we could add in any new ideas, which, looking back on it now, was probably not the best thing to be thinking at the time. So it's also notable that Fujibashi's influences were rather different from his peers. While Eiji Anuma mentioned Skyrim and Witcher 3 in respect to open world game designs, Fujibashi was more intrigued by Minecraft and Terraria. I could learn from the sense of adventure exploration and how it inspired creativity, he enthused. He also looked carefully at ways to nudge players in directions rather than overtly direct them. When we were thinking about weapons, we considered that this world is a big open field and we wanted players to go on an adventure. We actually called it a term, gravity, as to pulling players into that world. We were thinking, especially because it's a big world, if we just let players do what they wanted, they wouldn't really know what to do. So one of the things we thought about is, for example, if we place an enemy that dropped certain weapons, then that player would feel like they want to go and defeat that enemy. Because if it was really truly free and players could do whatever, they would probably just avoid it. So instead, they would be more inclined to go and defeat that enemy, and once they defeat it, they would get a certain weapon. And that was scattered all over the world. So, that was one thing we considered doing, thinking about weapons. But perhaps the key thing he seems to have initiated is the philosophy of multiplication gameplay. On working on the game early on, he said, after keeping those basic elements, we started some conversations such as, can't we play the way we used to play in the dungeons now on the field? Or on the contrary, it might also be interesting if we play the way we used to play on the field in the dungeons. This kind of multiplication of playing I mentioned before, players could get through a puzzle by method one, method two, or change method three into method four, even completely different method A or B. It naturally drifted a lot from other Zelda games. We just simply tried to change the I am getting tired of another routine of Zelda experiences. We considered why we're getting tired, meanwhile thinking about how to make puzzles more interesting in another way. And these thoughts became part of the multiplication of playing experiences. 
I didn't set principles of changing, I just tried to convince staff that it's possible for us to change the concept that if we change something, it won't be Zelda anymore. It's one thing for an outsider to come in and upturn the table of Zelda, but by this point Hidamaru Fujibashi had directed more Zeldas than anyone else and had been with the franchise for well over a decade, so it's a testament to his flexibility of thinking and vision that he drove the revolution that became Breath of the Wild. With the larger scope of the Era of the Wild games, we were able to see more of Fujibashi's own interests come into play. The idea of vertical gameplay that he introduced in Skyward Sword was unfinished business to him and was reintroduced with success in Tears of the Kingdom. We know from Kit and Krista's brilliant podcast that he's mad keen on vehicles, and if this proclivity was hinted at in Breath of the Wild's Master Cycle Zero, it was on full display in the vehicle pack Tears of the Kingdom. He also has an adventurous spirit, mentioning that he is part of an adventure club with other Nintendo employees. We do things like cave diving, where you actually go down into the water to get into a cave, as well as rafting tours and so on, he elaborates. I know this may not be such a big deal in the West, but in Japan, it's quite an adventure. Of course, rafting, caving and exploring the depths is a hugely distinctive feature of Tears of the Kingdom and clearly real life inspired many of the developers. Fujibashi-san is also very attached to his hometown. Indeed, the Breath of the Wild map was modelled in terms of size on the city of Kyoto and Fujibashi used this mental reference even when trying to imagine Sky Islands. Using Kyoto as a mental model of the Breath of the Wild world map fits in well with Fujibashi's philosophy of what he calls sensory and intuitive. He's always taking the abstract and trying to make it tactile and tangible and logical. For example, when A.J. Numa was initially sceptical of the apparent ugliness of the green glue look of the objects assembled with Ultra Hand, Fujibashi and the team defended it. His philosophy comes through perhaps most strongly in this quote. The history of the Zelda series is very long, so I should note that a lot of what I'm about to say includes some speculation of my own. But I think perhaps it's because throughout the series, even though the directors have changed, I feel we've made the games to allow players to get to one specific sensational experience, a universal experience, a feeling that exists in everyone no matter the time period, something that's not really affected by a difference in the views you hold or the culture you come from. There can be a language barrier, but it's not an absolute. Anyone will be excited when they manage to get the ring out in one of those metal wire puzzles, right? That's the kind of experience I'm talking about. I think it's because Zelda games are built to treasure that feeling that it makes it so adaptable. Childlike glee seems to be another feature at the heart of Fujibashi's approach, as much as it is at the heart of Nintendo. There's a sense of adventure, he explains, of the Zelda games, a sense of fun that you might have experienced as a child, way back in the day that you might have forgotten as you grow up and do adult things. And so I think Zelda can be an opportunity to relive that, to recall that, to experience that. Of course, having such a huge and profound impact on the Zelda franchise doesn't seem to have changed him. In 2018, he said he hasn't found his own trademark addition to Zelda games yet, to rival Miyamoto or Anuma. This led A.G. Anuma to joke, we were talking about this recently. So in Breath of the Wild, there's an island where you get stripped of all your items and you start out naked. And we were kind of thinking, wait, there is something similar to that in Skyward Sword and Oracle of Ages. So we were thinking, maybe that's his trademark. Modesty aside, what's clear is that Fujibashi is the absolute linchpin of the Zelda development team. As much as A.J. Numa is intimately involved in the evolution of the franchise and has shepherded it for a quarter century, it's very clear that Fujibashi has become an absolute rock of the production team, one of Nintendo's most formidable talents and deserving of a place in history in his own right as a true genius in his field. In the next video in this series, we're going to be looking in more depth at the mechanics Fujibashi has developed for his games, tracing the evolution of his ideas and the philosophy from Game Boy Color to the present day, to see what's changed and what's staying the same. We're going to drill into what multiplicative gameplay really means, and by doing this, we're going to try to identify what is the irreducible core, the beating heart, the supporting pillars that make a modern Zelda game work. And we'll see how the student has become the master as Fujibashi's sensibilities seem to have outgrown aspects of Miyamoto and Anuma's approaches to developing Zelda in some ways. Thank you so much for watching this longer than normal video. If you enjoy longer form content, please drop a comment and hit like. It just remains me to say thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.